This is Joy J. Moore. We want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to this spring campaign. We're happy to report that thanks to your generosity, we exceeded our ambitious $50,000 goal. Thank you. We know you are regularly on this site and we're grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. We're so grateful for all of you who choose to become or to increase your monthly contribution as working preacher sustainers. We truly appreciate your commitment to support this ministry monthly. Thank you for keeping working preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And we miss our colleague, Joy J. Moore, who we expect to be returning to us sometime soon. This is a busy time of year to be a dean, or so I've been told. And we miss our colleague, Joy J. Moore, who we expect to be returning to us sometime soon. This is a busy time of year to be a dean, or so I've been told. It's the second Sunday after Pentecost on June 6, 2021. We have two different Old Testament readings. The first one, the thematic reading, is Genesis 3, 8 through 15. The semi-continuous reading is 1 Samuel 8, verses 4 through 20. And if you want, you can toss in 11, 14 through 15. The psalm is 130. The epistle reading is 2 Corinthians 4, 13 through 5, 1. And from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. Well, wait, wait a second. Last week we had John 3, Nicodemus at night. I was so looking forward to John 4 and the Samaritan woman by day. What happened? We're back Caroline? to work. Why? We should be in John 4 this week. Well, your V is the week of John and Mark. And so now it's the Mark's week. turn for a while. I like the week of John Sorry, the year of. Anyway. Euro. I kind of like the week of Mark. And We're, we'll come back to John in the middle of summer. A couple more weeks. Bread of life. Woohoo. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, just to note. It's also the uh, old the 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 token Old Testament person uh, on the podcast gets happy because now we have an extra Old Testament text to talk about every week. The semi continuous reading. Uh, I always urge people to consider using it if they're not from a tradition that um, normally uses the the semi continuous reading. Uh, it's a perfect place to drop in. Uh, by the uh, luck of the way that the, the lectionary now works, uh, we happen to drop in right at a starting point. This is the this is the point where the people reject Samuel's son, sons, and they demand a king. So I think it's a perfect place to drop in on that story uh, that we're going to follow for people for preachers who, who use that thread. We're going to follow that all season. Uh, all the way up into Christ the King or reign of God. But let's start by talking about Mark 3. Well, we are back in Mark after a significant time in John, all of the Easter season. And so it means that the preacher, I think, needs to kind of reorient uh, herself and think about, okay, what what's what's what do I need to remember about Mark again uh, and 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 this gospel? And I think one of the things that uh, you helped us remember, Rolf, back at the beginning when we were doing uh, starting year B, uh, and we talked about this a number of times, came back to it is the importance of Mark 1, 14 to 15 as as the really the the central verses of this gospel and what, what Jesus, uh, what Jesus means for Mark, and what Jesus means for those who encounter him of that repentance, uh, and uh, and looking for the kingdom of God in our midst. And so, uh, to go back to the, those verses, and then also just where have we been so far? What what's happened so far in the Gospel of Mark? So that not that you need to rehearse all of that in your sermon, and actually, please don't. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a couple of, of points there to to get people back into Mark, but uh, but for your own sense of okay, here we are, uh, and and we have a, a, a in a way a similar kind of pattern that we get in Mark of a, of an intercalation uh, where we have this this uh, 
oh, I don't know if you uh, inter encounter with with Jesus and his family, uh, members of his uh, of his family. Uh, and uh, and then we have um, the scribes and then coming back to his family again of of who is it that's recognizing who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. And so uh, I that that's in part why John uh, or John, sorry. <laughs> little slip there. Uh, why Mark 1, 14 to 15 is so important, because that's, that's really what's at stake here, is, is uh, having the perspective that the kingdom of God has come near, is present in Jesus, and, and to what extent those, the closest ones to him, then don't. This is an incredibly important passage, I think, for understanding Mark, you know, the, the gospel as a whole, it's 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 crucial context for understanding what goes on in 1 14 through 15 that the the proclamation of the kingdom of god is one that creates conflict and controversy and is best understood as an incursion into enemy territory and so you've got here two groups that have incredible power over jesus you've got his family the people who supposedly know him best the people who kind of define his sense of belonging in the world, in that society. And not only have they come out to restrain him, but they're the ones who are saying that he's gone out of his mind. The translation there in verse 21 is they, not people. His mm -hmm. family thinks he's lost it. Mm -hmm. uh, then you've got the scribes who happen to be the scribes from Jerusalem. These are the major leagues. These are probably temple-based scribes. These are people with a, a tremendous amount of power over life in Judea, in Galilee. So you got the family who says, we think he's lost it. We think he needs to come home. And you've got the religious authorities at the top of the, near the very top of the pyramid who say, this guy is satanic, mm -hmm. right? Nobody says he's a charlatan or he's fake. They all say something is terribly, terribly wrong here with him. He's a danger to himself. He's a danger to the community. I mean, this is, this is huge in terms of the, the people who are rejecting him. And Jesus then responds to that by, trying to embarrass the scribes, but then also redefining his sense of who family is, which is incredibly dangerous um, for him to do. Or as I like to say, this is why they kill him at the end of the story, uh, or it's part of it. The, the other thing to note is that this little parable he tells about tying up the strong man and plundering his house is also, I think, in a way, is a mission statement from Mark's gospel. This is what he's come to do. He's He's not bringing a kingdom into a kingdomless place. He's bringing in an alternate reign that has to displace uh, the one who rules it now, this, this strong man, this, the, the, the satanic power that holds sway over the world and its inhabitants. So you're going to, you know, June 6th, people think, oh, summertime, things are a little more relaxed now at church, and you're going you're gonna to hit them with a board you know, across the back and say, wake up with a text like this. Well, and I think I, two things, oh, two things, yeah. let me just, two things. Go, go for it. Um, one is that Jesus, to just put this into context, Jesus has appointed the 12 and that Jesus' own house, if you will, uh, is all, there's already an indication of division with the fact that, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Uh, in verse 19. So you have that sense already that the, those who who's inside and who's outside and who's going to be able to, that Jesus' own sort of surrounding, you know, uh, base is, uh, there's already, uh, there's already that, um, that, that, that questioning um, that we get that's intimated in Judas. And then in verse uh, 32, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside. That and that's such a huge theme in in Mark of of insiders and outsiders. And now that's where his family is. Uh, and so th those are just two things that I think uh, underscore what you were talking about, Matt. Details in the text that I think are important related to that. So uh, one of the things that's obviously been, been a subtext of what we've talked about so far about Mark is, okay, we're back to Mark, and you're going to need to give people some context, especially if you're the kind of person that 
primarily preaches the gospel uh, lesson, you need context. And so, uh, because it's weird to drop down just halfway, I mean, into a sentence, actually, the end of uh, verse 19, then he went home and the crowd, so he's come back. And so the inelegant division of the, of the passage. And we've just had another thing that's important earlier in chapter three, which is um, the demons say, we know who you are, Jesus, you're the son of God. So a lot of this is about who is Jesus and, you, and the, the, um, the irony, the deep spiritual irony that the, the demons know who Jesus is, but as Luther loved to point out, knowledge is not the same as faith. They don't have faith. So not, just knowing that Jesus is the son of God is not the right, that's not faith. Faith is not intellectual assent. Faith is trust and following. Uh, and, and, and so you see that there's some people who don't even know yet who Jesus is, who, who are in, you know, uh, that he calls brothers and sisters, um, even though they don't yet know because Peter hasn't uh, confessed it in these early chapters, uh, the, the slow revelation of uh, the identity of Jesus. I want, and I, our, our mutual teacher, Don Jewell, loved this verse in terms of Mark's theology, the, uh, the plundering Matt, that you've talked about, uh, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Uh, that Jesus' mission in Mark must be understood in light of in light of that commitment that Jesus is on the way to challenge, and there will be no compromise. There'll be no peace until um, until Christ has won this this battle on our behalf. Yeah, it's a deeply disturbing image. I mean, he describes here what we would call in our day and age a home invasion. Right? It's it's not. <laughs> he hasn't come to negotiate uh, or to make peace. He's come to displace, to dislodge. And so, welcome to a gospel that's full of apocalyptic imagery and language, um, and a lot of apocalyptic literature <laughs> literature uses language of warfare. And and the commentary talks about this. In, in helpful ways. We should point out too, before we move on, that verse 29 always captures people's attention. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a lot of worry in the church about that. I hear this from mm -hmm. students all the time mm -hmm. who yeah. are afraid because they've, you know, uh, dropped a, hit their, hit their thumb with a hammer and said, God damn it, or something like that, that they're, right. that's it. Uh, no forgiveness for you. Um, but to put this in context and David Schnaz at Jacobson does a good job of naming that and then kind of quickly saying, look, you have to look at the context here. This is about attributing the work of God to the devil right. when you've been yeah. given a, 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 an entirely clear view of what's going on here. And yet you still, um, you don't just say like, I need to see more, but you say, no, I've made up my mind. That is in fact yeah. demonic. And you've so it's not like it's unforgivable in the sense that you've offended God to the point where God can't see to forgive you. It's You've shown yourself to be on the reach of what, 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 whatever could possibly convince you. Yeah, and, and it's the, hyperbole. You've judged. You've judged the good as evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also think, uh, in light of that, um, there's an old, especially Roman Catholic interpretation of of the sin against the Holy Spirit that goes like this: um, your, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you commit suicide you have sinned against the Holy Spirit, and that is unforgivable. Um, I, I had a, a roommate whose brother, while I was living with him, committed suicide, and the mother was absolutely sure, uh, based on that interpretation, that her son had gone to hell. And so I think it, it's worth undoing that, that no, that's not what the text says. I can see how you get there, but the text says, if you say Jesus is satanic, mm -hmm. that's and attribute the work of Jesus then to the work of Satan. That's actually what Mark is saying. Yeah. And, and um, you know, that was an incredible burden for um, this mother to, uh, mm -hmm. to bear. So the church has hurt people uh, with its interpretations and times like this are, are opportunities to undo those, um, to undo some of that damage. You can't undo it all. Don't you, uh, you're not the Holy Spirit, so. 
where preaching speaking becomes of, corrective. Yes. Speaking of, of passages and corrections, <laughs> Genesis 3. <laughs> well, it's weird to drop down. This is the thematic version. Um, and it's, if you drop, it's so weird to drop down without, you know, doing Genesis 2 and then 3 and then even into 4, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's odd. And what's the thematic connection again? I think it's the, the idea <laughs> of, of, um, Satan serpent striking Satan. the heel okay. and you crushing his yeah. head. I think it's this idea of, um, no, I think it's Satan that, yeah, that yeah. this, who is the who is the Satan that has come, the strong man who has taken over God's good creation? Mm -hmm. And there's actually there's very good exegetical reason to to go ahead that the traditional understanding that that um, the ancient audience would have understood the serpent that is, by the way, the seraphim, uh, the seraphim Nachashim uh, that we just saw in Isaiah six last week. Um, that they would have thought, oh yeah, this is one of those heavenly beings that's with God in God's counsel. Um, and so, the, I mean, there's very good reason exegetically, although uh, 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 the more recent thing is just to say, the only thing we can know about the serpent is that it is one of the creatures God has created. That's all we know. But clearly it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a, an ideological story that's trying to explain the origins of why we're all born into a broken creation. Mm -hmm. You know what I would do? I would preach on Mark 3 for three minutes longer and not read this text on this given well, day. Well, that's what I was about to say, that if you read this text, uh, if you read this text and don't preach on it, well, just don't do that. <laughs> because there's, uh, the you know, the commentary points this out, but this, this of course, is a huge, uh, prob a hugely problematic text when it comes to uh, when it comes when it comes to interpreting um, and casting women uh, in a in a particular kind of role, uh, and so which again the commentary uh, of scapegoating Eve, and so the commentary talks about that. But I I would strongly recommend to our preachers that you either preach this text or you don't and you don't read it because then you it's one of those texts that just lands. And the fact that you don't address that history of interpretation, I think is irresponsible. But oh. if you do read it and preach on it or address it, uh, it is tr the story is trying to uh, explain why we are all born under a curse. And in the story, the ground is cursed and both human beings uh, receive a curse, although you don't see it in this passage. That's one of the problems. And, and this in some way to get at the point that why is it that we are, I mean, what is the condition that we're all born into that uh, we are all born into a broken creation? That is a truth that needs to be spoken somewhere. Uh, otherwise, what, why do we need a savior? And I, I so I think that um, in a, maybe in the adult class and some other ways that you do get at this because a lot of people have a really naive romantic um, theological anthropology that they don't understand that there's, I have a problem within me and I'm born into a world that has problems uh, that are not overcome. They cannot be overcome by ourselves. And the way in which the history of, uh, the history of misogynist and sexist misinterpretation of, of this passage is a symptom of our broken reality. I love that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so name that too, preachers. Well, that's preaching as corrective. Yeah, exactly. Semi-continuous. No, no. I was going to say what would help is if we just had a, a, a king who could take care of all this stuff for us. Oh, yeah. Always. Fight our battles for us. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. I mean, see, this is, okay. Why is it that demagogues gain power? Uh, why is it that uh, dictators gain power? Because we is that a rhetorical them. question? Actually, this time it's a rhetorical question for which I have a part of an answer, uh, which is why I didn't ask it like directly. But <laughs> I mean, that is we do long for a government that works mm -hmm. because part of being born into a broken world is, is 
we're born into systems of governance. Mm -hmm. We're going to have systems of governance. If even anarchism is a system of governance that totally doesn't work anywhere it's been tried. Mm -hmm. So we need some sort of government, uh, government. And no form of government is going to save us, but there's so many, okay, I almost used a bad word. Let me just say, naive people who think that we can find a perfect system of government, and then they project all this stuff onto a demagogue who says, look at me, I'm the answer, in spite of all the evidence that you need that's right in front of your face to, to understand, yeah, they're not the answer. But that's, uh, but that's what the people did. They were like, Samuel, this system of judges led by the Holy Spirit doesn't work very well. And look, your, your sons after you are corrupt. So what, what's the solution? Let's have a king who's going to have sons after him who are going to be corrupt. Well, and I think and, you know, this wider, this wider uh, theme of, of naming our human brokenness uh, and the, that human condition, I mean, that's a, that's a, those are two other themes here that are, that are present in this passage besides thinking that we can have, we can put into place a, a perfect kind of, of ruler. Uh, but the other theme is in verse 5, a uh, point for us then, a king to govern us like other nations. Oh like my God. That, you yeah. know, that temptation to, <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to eschew that distinctiveness of being in relationship with God uh, and that that lays claim on how we are and who we are and, uh, and that we let, we were fine to let that go. And then the other thing is just this, what we see here is this, uh, uh, const, this, the, the constant reality or the dynamic between God's will and human freedom. And how is the, how does that work itself out? Uh, and, and that, and so, ex, you know, it's a exposing that the dynamics of that relationship. So it's a fascinating text to name some of those realities of, of who we are as human beings to, to name those truths. I, I want to, um, I want to suggest a, that we be specific about who the, these people are or who the, they are in the text or what people in general are like that. Uh, as I read it, I look at this and I think it's the elders of Israel who come up with this great idea. Um, and the reason they come up with this great idea is because Samuel's sons aren't up for the task. So these elders feel like something's slipping out of control, right? Mm -hmm. They're afraid of the future. And so they're like, well, here's our plan, right? We want somebody to fight our battles for us. We want to be like the other nations. And then Samuel comes back and says, here's the cost, right? He will take, he will take, he will take, he will take. And so you've got people who are afraid of a changing situation, people who are afraid maybe of their own influence, or at least of their religious vision, not making it into the future. And they essentially sacrifice their children. They sacrifice the future generations for the sake of this, for the sake of maintaining some kind of power or, or, or having some kind of assurance of a particular future. So there's people who, there are, there are innocent victims in this, I think, in terms of the people who don't get a say in who gets to form the government um, and are going to be, you know, fodder for this, for the kings of the future. And it's also um, these future generations that I think they willfully, in ignoring Samuel, yes, they disregard God, but they also, um, yeah, I, I think the, the bigger price is paid by people who aren't present in the conversation. So that's yeah. why I name that as another reality of how this stuff works in the real world. Well, it's always true. I mean, that's always true, right? I mean, you're exactly right that, uh, first of all, it's very rash. Their request is really rational. Um, Israel is being oppressed uh, and losing wars. They're losing wars to their neighbors who are better organized. Their neighbors have kings. Their neighbors have Iron, it's the early Iron Age, end of the Bronze Age, early Iron Age. Their neighbors have iron and they don't. They're losing battles. And, and then they get home and Samuel has uh, appointed his sons for taking bribes in their, in their role as judges and doing injustice, injustice. So externally, we're losing wars. Internally, we've got corruption. It's a really rational 
thing. Let's organize ourselves like organize ourselves like those people. Their system works better than ours. Mm -hmm. uh, but to do so is to reject God and to reject their chosenness. Now, I think it's really important to say, d d make sure this, that you're not saying that this is how Israel is as opposed to the church. The church is like right. this. We yeah. read these stories because they're about us. We reject our chosenness all the time and, and follow other leaders. First, tell them their ways. Here's what they're good for. They're going to take your sons for their armies and they're going to die. They're, take, they're going to take your, their daughters for your harem, for their harem and for their bakeries. And they're going to live lives of servitude, you know, but they're going to take your money. They're going to take your crops. Yep. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to need a savior, somebody like Jesus. If only we had contemporary examples to help people see this. I don't have any. All right. <laughs> Why Psalm 130 this week? Or maybe that's not the right question to ask. Oh, good morning, dog. Well, um, Psalm, maybe, go ahead. Just a reminder, we do not have enough resources at Working Preacher to write a commentary on the Psalm for both of the Old Testament readings. So Psalm 130 is the Psalm for the thematic. So what you've got is the introduction of sin. And now here you have a penitential Psalm, a cry for forgiveness. That's the rationale. Mm. The Psalm 130 mm. is a response mm. to... Uh, the Genesis 3 reading, I do not have in front of me, I should have done this, whatever the response, the psalmic response to uh, 1 Samuel 8 might be, I will look it up momentarily, but I think this is, a, this is a psalm people should know. Out of the Depths, I cry to you, uh, name of, the title of a famous book on the psalms, uh, just the power of prayer, living in the spirit is to live in prayer, including God's ready forgiveness. Uh, remember back in Mark 3, the supposed uh, prayer, sin that cannot be forgiven. It's good to remember that there is forgiveness with you so that you might be revered. Well, and I think that given uh, where our conversation has go gone in terms of, of naming, uh, naming the systems and the human condition that we, that we find ourselves, that this is a, this is a adequate and appropriate response uh, to say, okay, so let's, and it might even be, maybe this is the response after the sermon, if that's the direction that you go, uh, that this is, how do we respond? And, and once, we've, once we've named that we reject our chosenness <laughs> or that we um, uh, our, our inability to see that the kingdom of God is near, uh, this penitential psalm would work liturgically. How about that? Yeah, and before we move on, the, the other psalm is Psalm 138, a, a psalm which mentions... Uh, it's a praise psalm, and it mentions all the kings of the earth shall praise you, uh, I suspect. Um, and it's supposedly, uh, it's a psalm attributed to David. So that, that's the rationale there. A word right. about the epistle. Second Corinthians, we have five weeks. I love that. Second Corinthians. Really? Yeah. You really do? Yeah, we should have, probably have Lois Malcolm, our colleague, who... Um, is as obsessed with Second Corinthians as Caroline is with John, Matt with X, and me with Psalms. That is, that's something to say right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We talked a bit about the challenge of, of dropping into a passage without any context. We talked about that with Mark 3. I think we have to do that with Second Corinthians, that, that people know part of what's going on in this letter or it's this part of, of the book is... Paul's trying to navigate some significant strife between himself and his audience. And yes, he's speaking theologically to them, but he's building up toward um, his effort, his articulation of the need for him and his ministry partners to be reconciled with the Corinthian believers. And so he says great things here uh, about God and about our current struggles but this is all moving toward an appeal for reconciliation. Uh, and Jenny Peets in her commentary talks about that uh, in like the, the penultimate paragraph. But, but just to note that, that Paul isn't just doing theology for the sake of um, instruction, right? He's not working through a curriculum, but he's trying to say the reason we need to reconcile isn't because, you know, I'm afraid of conflict, uh, speaking now in Paul's voice. But it's because the resurrection demands that. The resurrection makes this new age, this new way of relating to each other. Um, and so for us to be reconciled is 
is a, is a foretaste of the glory to come, so to speak. I mean, that's that's where he's headed with this. So to help people see that, that the, the way we negotiate our problems in the church isn't just to find pragmatic solutions or ethical solutions. It's it's to look first and foremost for theological uh, a theological basis. Now we pull in other wisdom and resources to do that, but but for Paul, everything you need to know about why you should get along is somehow there in cross and resurrection.